Welcome back to the second part of the basics of climate change for people interested in health. Now, what you see here is projections in the future. And at the same time, you see the geographical um, display uh, where the warming um, occurs most in the upper uh, two graphs and, and where rainfall occurs most and where rainfall decreases. Let's look at the first upper um, graphs and let's focus on the right one, which is the, the toughest scenario with the largest warming effect. It, it shows it uh, more nicely, the other ones this also shows it, that in the polar areas you get a much darker red, which means you can have up to 8, 9, 11 degrees where the ice is. Uh, so that's the first rule. If you go polewards, the degrees of warming increase. The second rule is if you go high up the mountains, so altitudinal-wise, you get more warming. That is very bad because that's also where the ice is. So for, here's the Himalayas, mm -hmm. and you see in the Himalayas there's a larger degree of warming than, let's say, in the, in the Sahara. In, in the Sahara, you have two to three degrees, or in sub-Saharan Africa, which is doesn't sound much, but uh, people there are already at the limits of their physiological adaptation, and we'll hear more about this in one of the, the next uh, lectures. So, and the third um, rule is where you are on land, you have higher degree of warming, look at Russia, um, opposed to over the water, that's intuitive somehow. If you look on the bottom part, and again you look on the one with the, with the more extreme climate on the, on the right, you see also that there is a patchwork of uh, brown areas in the, on the oceans and over land which are drier. Look at California, look at southern Europe, look at western Australia, look at sub-Saharan Africa, and areas where it gets wetter and more, more rainy. And you see here the South Asian continent, you see East Africa and parts of Latin America. And in the north, to the North Pole, you see a lot of more rain as well. So it is a little bit misleading if we say global climate change, because climate change is very different uh, regionally dissolved, resolved. Um, this is important to bear in mind because this is a course on the global aspects and you need to understand where you are so that you can look at what will strike you when and what the health consequences of this might be. Now we know that climate change is particular in that it is irreversible for all practical purposes. And mankind has never faced such a challenge that you do something bad and you cannot say, okay, we stop now and we have corrected our behavior and everything will be fine. In principle, that's what you could have done with smoking. A smoker who stops after a couple of years has roughly the same risk of getting lung cancer as a non-smoker. But with a planet, it, it doesn't work that way because the CO2 we have emitted today stay there, as you see in the first line, for 100 to 1,000 years and it will haunt our children and grandchildren. CH4, meaning methane, is for up there for 10 years. Uh, N2O, or laughing gas, coming from diesel engines, 150 years. So what we do now is up in the air and will stay there, and we cannot take it back for all practical purposes. Obama, President Obama says there is no plan B, and he's right. We cannot say at a certain moment, now we know everything and now we stop emitting, but then it will be too late. You see one interesting line here, and that's the line of black carbon. Climate active pollutant, CAP. And that is only five years. It is a small component of all greenhouse gases, below 5% of the effect of greenhouse gases. But if we do something about this, we will see an effect in five years. So almost immediately for climate uh, time reasons, it's almost immediate. And we will see more that black carbon is very bad for women's health and children's health, those who cook with biomass, and that's more than 2 billion women. They uh, produce soot, which is black carbon, which is um, damaging their health and the children's health, and at the same time it is a climate active gas. 
So if we do something for the climate, we also do something for the health of these women. We will hear more about this under the heading of co-benefits of climate policy. What's good for climate is good for health. That is the bumper sticker. Now let's look back in time and you see that there is a seesaw, uh, there are some cycles there. We go back from 400,000 years, that's what scientists can do by drilling holes in the ice at the ice caps in the Antarctic. 400,000 years we know what the temperature was, we know what the CO2 was and we see that the CO2 was maximum 300 and minimum 200. That's the band with it floated. Ice times came and went and in the last hundred years, it's the last sliver of time on the right hand side, it shoots up. What happened? This is man humankind who has uh, industrialized, who's using now for the first time, first time coal, oil and gas massively to power their industrial revolution, our industrial revolution. And if you look at this uh, the sliver on the right hand side and blow it up, you see a picture that also goes up and that is the temperature rise now since the beginning of industrialization. If you look at the left, 1860, 1850, that's roughly when the effects of industrialization became really felt. And if you take this as zero degrees, you see that we are already at 0.6. In fact, today we are already at 0.8 degrees above pre-industrial levels. So climate change is not something that scientists worry about for the future. Climate change is happening now as we speak. We have already 0.8 degrees and we are facing more towards the end of the century. How much? We will see in the next slides what scientists have to tell us. But let me first um, talk about uncertainty. Every statistical estimate, particularly any projection into the future, is bound by definition to be fraught with uncertainties. Sometimes you can quantify them very nicely using the laws of statistics. Sometimes you do it in a different way. But in any case, there is uncertainty. Those who use the argument, let's wait until we know it for certain, are playing really with fire, literally, because we will never know for certain until we see it and then it is too late. So if we wait, as some said, until it's really two degrees warmer and then we all believe it, there's so much CO2 and greenhouse gas already committed in the atmosphere that you cannot uh, do a U-turn. And as we have seen, it continues to creep. If we had a magic wand today and stopped all emissions, it would still creep up for another half degrees. So there's no waiting because we want more uncertainty. Already we have 8,000 scientists in the IPCC working on figuring out the best estimates. So what do these scientists, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, what models do they have? And these are the best models that mankind can come up with today. Let's look at what climate scientists have to tell us uh, about the future. In this graph you see on the bottom part the timeline between 2000, 2100 and 2300 here. Here you see on the vertical axis the temperature. We all know that we should not exceed two degrees and there are very concrete reasons for this. But if you see the high climate scenario, which is in the absence of climate policy, it, it will get to four degrees by the end of the century and then rise and rise and rise and never stabilize. At the end of two, uh, 2200 we will be at 8.5 degrees and then it goes further and further. So uh, this scenario, which is dubbed RCP, 8.5, just you can read it up in the notes. It's a realistic scenario in the absence of climate policy. The next bad, if you like, climate scenario is RCP6, which is also going beyond two degrees and then continuing, continuing to have four degrees at the end of the 2300s. So this is also a scenario that is uh, in, in the four degrees area in the future. The only scenarios that are broadly within limits 
are the lower ones and of course this is the only one where we see a slow downfall of temperatures. So our aim must be to steer for this. Unfortunately it's probably too late to be in that corridor or to go on this one at least and that is in the hands of our policymakers. And as health depends so much on climate, we as health people need to influence our, our policymakers, climate policymakers, to go on one of these uh, areas. Here we are now, and here's where we don't want to be on the four degrees. In a four degree world, particularly under this high scenario, the scientists, and I was part of this uh, group who said that, says the capacity of the human body to thermoregulate may be exceeded on a regular basis, particularly during manual labor, raising doubt about the habitability of some areas. Thank you very much.